Welcome everyone to Looking Back But Also Forward, a refresher on the employer mandate and ACA reporting responsibilities. Thank you all so much for joining us. The Benefits Compliance team is moderating today's call. They will be answering the questions you send through the Q&A today. We will try our best to answer all of your questions, but if for whatever reason we are unable to get to your question today, please follow up with your advisor for further assistance. Today's presentation is being recorded. We will be sharing the recording in the, in, in the fo follow-up email excuse me, and on the NFP website. If there are any portions of this call that you missed by Monday, you will receive an email with a link to the full recording. The PowerPoint slides used during this presentation will be shared in the same email. At this time, I'd like to introduce our speakers for today's call. Joining us today are Elizabeth Allen, Vice President and Counsel of Benefits Compliance at NFP, and Kelly Ekman, Vice President of Benefits Compliance at NFP. Beth, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Amber, and welcome everyone uh, to Looking Back, but also forward, a refresher on the employer mandate. Um, it is coming towards the end of the year, um, and we think this is a good time to kind of have a refresher for some and maybe an introduction to others on the employer mandate and the employer mandate reporting or reporting requirements. And so I'm going to jump in. There is me and Kelly um, online. I'm going to jump along to our little disclaimer that we always give, which is basically that, you know, this information is for general guidance and we are not your attorneys or your tax counsel. Uh, so keep that in mind. And so as far as an agenda today, we're going to start off talking about the employer mandate um, and we're going to answer a few questions there that really give a high level review of who the employer mandate applies to and what it requires. OK, and then after doing that discussion, we'll switch uh, gears and talk a bit about ACA reporting um, and again, who that reply uh who that applies to and what is required of employers for for reporting. So I'm going to kick us off and just start off with a employer mandate refresher. And really from a high level, the employer mandate is basically a provision of the ACA um, that requires that applicable large employers, which we will define, must offer full-time employees and their child dependents minimum essential coverage that is minimum value and affordable. If they don't, then basically they risk paying penalties to the IRS, okay? And so that is the overarching theme or concept around the employer mandate. And we're going to kind of take the next several minutes to go through these uh, underlined concepts to, to let you know what the rule requires. Now, the first question or what we're going to discuss is, are you an applicable large employer or an ALE for short, which you might hear me say a few times today? So in short, the employer mandate is going to apply to employers with 50 or more full time equivalent employees. Right. And so I think a lot of times people will just say full time employees, right, 50 full time employees. And I think for a lot of employers that makes sense. But it's really this idea of full time equivalent employees. And so there's going to be kind of this calculation that's required that is not as simple as just saying, well, how many full time employees do you have? OK, in determining the 50 threshold, um, it's going to be based on the number of full time equivalent employees in the previous calendar year. OK, so there's always this dynamic or we'll get questions often where employers say, OK, well, last year we had 30. You know, we had an average of 30 and then this year we grew. Um, when are we going to be considered to be an applicable large employer? And the answer is generally that if you had, let's say, an average of 50 plus full time equivalent employees in the previous previous year, then you would be subject to the uh, employer mandate in the year after that, right? So for example, with 2024, we would look to 2023 to see how many or the average of how many full-time equivalents you had and decide whether or not you're subject to the employer mandate in 2024 based on the numbers in 2023, okay? Another part of determining this 50 threshold is that all employees of related employers are going to be counted in this count, okay? So that's kind of an ode to the controlled group, rule, group rules, which are rules that we get under the Internal Revenue Code that determine um, what kind of common ownership companies can have in order to be looked at or viewed as a single employer uh, to both the IRS and the DOL for a lot of reasons, okay? And so keep in mind that, you know, a lot of employers will come to us and say, well, look, are we a controlled uh, group, 
right? Um, and that is really a question that your accountant or legal advisor should answer for you because it involves a series of tests that the IRS has that are not always very simple, right? Um, and so that is not something that we can answer for you, but you do want to know the answer of whether or not your company is considered a control group of companies because it is going to affect the requirements under the employer mandate as well as other, you know, employment law and taxation issues, okay? Now, keep in mind that there are some people that you don't have to count when you're trying to get to that 50 people person threshold. Self-employed owners are not counted, right? And so self-employed owners, depending on the type of structure of the company, could be partners, could be shareholders. Anyone really who's considered self-employed would not be counted. Employees that are on TRICARE or receive uh, Veterans Affairs coverage also do not have to be counted, as well as seasonal workers who are employed four months or less per year. And I want to stop and distinguish right now seasonal workers from kind of the definition of seasonal employees for purposes of who is full time, because the requirement here is slightly different, right? And so when it comes to the employees that you don't have to count when getting to that threshold, it's very specifically seasonal workers who are employed four months or less. And that is going to be kind of distinguishable from the seasonal employees that will be talked about later when it comes to determining who is full time. And so as far as coming up with the actual number, remember that I mentioned that it's not just looking at full-time employees, but it's this idea of full-time equivalents. And so that takes a calculation that basically takes into account both full-time employees and those employees who are not working full-time hours, right? And so how you do that is kind of a series of steps, right? So for every month in the previous calendar year, you're going to count the employees who worked 130 hours. And those are going to be the number of full-time employees that you have. And again, you're going to be including all of those employees from a control group or affiliated employers um, based on their common ownership, okay? And so all of the full-time employees across all of the control group of companies, you're going to count those, um, and that's going to be one number. And then you're going to take all of the other workers, um, you're going to add up all their hours together, and then you're going to total them up and divide them by 120. And this is basically going to be the number of full-time equivalents, right? And so this is going to be your part-time people, this is going to be people who don't work that 130 hours a month and are not considered full-time, um, but some of them may work, you know, 90, or some of them may work 40 um, a month. And so you're going to add all those number numbers uh, together and then divide it by 120 to come up with the number of full-time equivalents. So then you'll add the full-time employees from step one and the full-time equivalents from step two uh, together. That is the full count of your full-time equivalents. And you're going to divide those by 12 uh, to determine the number of full-time equivalents for the year. All right. And so that is kind of how you proceed to do like this number to determine how many full time employee equivalents you had. Um, and keep in mind that there's, you're not going to have to round, you're not going to really round up. Right. So if it ends up being forty nine point five, um, then that's forty nine point five. That's not 50. Right. But if it's 50 or more, then the employer is going to be an applicable large employer and would have to comply with the employer mandate as well as reporting in the subsequent year. Now, we wanted to kind of include just a brief conversation about kind of where we see things go wrong for employers, right? And so there might be many of you who are on the call and know that you're an applicable large employer, and there might be some of you who are right there on the cusps, right? So you kind of want to pay attention to some of these, you know, uh, common pitfalls, if you will, to make sure that as you're doing the calculation that you're making the count correctly. Right. So obviously not understanding the prior calendar year dynamic of the ALE ca calculation um, would be a problem. You know, we find that sometimes employers will potentially offer coverage to all employees before they actually have to because they don't realize that the prior calendar year is what it's what's considered. You know, so the, in the example I gave earlier, you know, if somebody who uh, if you had an employer who increases their numbers in 2024 such that they go over 50, they might start to act like they are subject to the employer mandate in 2024. Um, where they might not have had to actually do that based on the numbers from 2023, right? Um, and so you want to keep that in mind, but that also goes the other way, right? So if you did grow in 2023, you want to make sure that you are complying with the mandate by 2024 based on those numbers from this year. <clears throat> 
And then obviously not counting all of the employees from all control group members um, is going to be an issue. A lot of employers sometime will have the question of whether or not, you know, they can look at them separately. Um, and the answer is no. Like for purposes of the employer mandate, you do have to actually count all of the employees of all the control group um, of companies. And then also we end up with some sticky situations, frankly, here. So for example, uh, specifically with mergers and acquisitions, it's not always as easy to figure out kind of what the answer is, right? And so it's relatively easy when you, let's say, merge um, a company that is a large already an ALE with another company that's already an ALE, right? We already know that both of them have to comply uh, with, the, with the employer mandate separately. So they obviously have to comply together, right? Because they have now merged together and they're much bigger. Um, it's also easy kind of when a large employer buys a smaller employer, right? So that small employer might not have been subject to the mandate, but that large employer is. And once they have bought on that brought on the employees from that smaller employer, they were already subject to the mandate. They're going to continue to be subject to the mandate, right? But in reporting, you might see some things here where that large employer is now having to report on uh, the employees from the smaller employer. It becomes a bit more gray when a small employer merges with a small employer, right? But then added together, they're both a, a large, basically they form an ALE. Right. Um, we don't have the, the amount of guidance that we would have liked to have gotten from the IRS when this type of things happen. Um, but it's kind of clear that, you know, obviously the most conservative view would be to say, OK, if they are both um, at the size where they would be subject or if, if together they are at the size where they would be subject to the employer mandate, you likely want to treat them that way. The next question would be, OK, well, when do we have to do that? Um, and so that's something where that small employer who merges with a small employer might need to get counsel involved just to make sure that they know what needs to happen. So keep in mind, we wanted to also point out that we have a number of resources about this conversation, right? And so we have a whole paper dedicated to applicable large employers and kind of a lot of the stuff that I just mentioned is going to be in this paper. And so keep in mind that you can ask your advisor for that, uh, as well as the IRS having some Q&As that they've provided that also give you additional information. All right, Kelly, you want to take on the next question for us? Yes, absolutely. Thanks, Beth. Um, so yeah, what... Once the employer has determined, okay, we're an applicable large employer, the next question really is, who is a full-time employee? Who do I actually need to offer this coverage to? So that's what we're going to walk through here to know kind of who are those employees you really need to be looking out for. So in this case, these are full-time employees. So those are the ones who are averaging 30 hours a week or 130 hours per month. And so there are a couple of different ways that employers can calculate uh, these these hours requirements. And so obviously for somebody that's, let's say just kind of your, what we'll think of as a normal full-time employee. So they work 40 hours a week, every week. Those are pretty easy to understand, but it's those who are gonna be those, you know, part-timers or variable hour employees where they don't just work that standard 40 hour week. That's where it's gonna let, get a little more tricky typically. But for employers to determine full-time employee status, there are two different ways that um, we are given. There are two things called, they're called measurement periods. So we have our monthly measurement period or monthly measurement method, and then a look back measurement method. And so those um, work a little bit differently. Obviously the monthly measurement method, that's where you are looking forward. So looking prospectively for someone's hours. So if they are going to be working 30 hours or more, they are offered coverage for that next month. Again, obviously for those employees that work kind of that standard 40 hour, 35 hour schedule, that's pretty easy to do because you know that they're going to be working the applicable hours. Where it's gonna get tricky is again, those part-time or variable hours. And that's where then we see employers using these look back measurement methods. And we won't go into a ton of detail today um, just because we could literally spend an hour talking just about the measurement periods, but just kind of the idea here that employers are essentially looking back in time in a period typically between six or 12 months and averaging an employee's hours across that time period. So typically we'll see employers do the look back measurement method for a 12 month period just because that's the longest time given and that way you're only doing it once a year. So you actually look back for a 12 month period for the employee's hours. And if they averaged that 30 hours per week during that look back period, they would be considered full time for purposes 
of the ACA, and thus they should be offered coverage for that next plan year. So that's sort of the high level overview of the measurement methods. And again, we've got some great publications, as Beth mentioned, and one of those does cover the various types of uh, measurement methods. So if you're just not sure um, about those or want some more details, definitely reach out to your consultant or account team member for those. Now, when we're thinking about hours, we think, okay, well, what hours actually count towards this measurement that I'm doing? Okay, so the hours we're looking at are those for which an employee is paid or entitled to pay. And so common examples of these hours that are pretty straightforward might be obviously normal paid time. So I'm working, I'm getting paid for those hours. And then we're going to look at time like vacation time, PTO, if you have paid sick time, um, you know, paid disability, you're going to have holiday leave, some leaves of absence. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about those rules and then jury duty. So those are some common hours of service that may count towards someone's calculation as part of that uh, measurement method. Now, I mentioned, um, you know, those leaves of absence. We, it gets a little different there, especially when we're talking about unpaid leaves of absence. So we are given a couple rules for what they call special leaves of absence. So those are leaves under FMLA, USERA, so the military leave or jury duty. So these are unpaid leaves. So again, it's not fitting this definition here of hours for which an employee is entitled to pay. However, the employee is um, credited for leave taken under those specific scenarios. So the employer is actually going to take into account the hours um, that occurred during that leave of absence. And there's a couple different ways that employers can you know, look at the time that falls under those specific leaves. Um, and again, our publication kind of goes into that in greater detail, but just know that, you know, there are a couple of special unpaid leaves of absence where an employee may actually be credited with hours to count towards those measurement methods. And then the other thing mentioned here is dependents. So again, we talked at the beginning, you know, the employer mandate, the employers have to offer coverage to employees and then their dependents. And so here, this definition of a child dependent we're looking at is a child who has not yet attained, attained age 26. And then it's kind of important to drill down into exactly which children um, fall under the mandate here. So these are children who are biological or adopted children. This does not include stepchildren or foster children or the children of a domestic partner, unless any of those children have been adopted. So I think it's important to realize that, that technically the mandate is really just looking at those biological or adopted children, as far as who you know, the law says has to be offered coverage. And again, it's important to see here, spouses are not included here, right? So the mandate is really just looking at offering coverage to those employees who are identified as full-time, and then those child dependents who meet the definition here. And so what do we see employers get wrong here? Can we get a lot of questions about, you know, who needs to be offered coverage? I'd say one of the biggest ones that we see here are temporary employees or interns. You know, a lot of people think automatically, oh, okay, it's a, it's a temporary employee or it's an intern. We don't have to offer them coverage. Well, that's not always true. Sometimes these employees can fall under that seasonal employee definition. And Beth mentioned it earlier, a little different than what she was talking about as part of the ALE calculation. But here, if we're looking at a seasonal employee, so it's somebody whose customary um, annual employment is not going to exceed six months, and the work is typically beginning and ending at approximately the same time each year. Okay, so you may have, let's say, interns fall into this category because you always have summer interns um, and they work from, let's say, May through August. Okay, so they're kind of beginning and ending around the same time of year or um, and they're not exceeding six months. Where we can see interns sometimes get into trouble is when you have that really great intern for the summer and then you decide to keep them around, right? Because maybe they go to college close by and they can somehow still manage a 30-hour um, 
work week, even on top of their schooling. So you can sometimes have issues there with interns. And, and so the big thing there is, again, don't just automatically assume that if you have this temporary employee or that intern that you don't have to offer them coverage. If you have somebody who is not meeting this seasonal definition and they are a short-term but full-time employee, they probably should still be offered coverage. Another thing that I, I'd say probably is the next um, most often asked thing we get are what happens when someone has a change in status? So we have an employee who's been a full-time employee, something's happened and now they're moving to part-time coverage. A lot of employers just assume, okay, they're going part-time as of December 1st, we need to cut off their benefits. And when I'm saying their benefits, we're really just talking through medical coverage here under the ACA. And so that's not true. Just because someone switches to part-time doesn't mean you can automatically cut them off. And I've got a note here. I mean, these rules really are very complicated because there are many factors that the employers have to look at. It depends on what measurement method you're using. Are you using the monthly measurement method or using that look back we talked about where you're you know, looking back for 12 months and locking someone into that status? And then it depends on whether they are a new hire so meaning they have not yet completed an initial measurement period, which would be their first 12 months of employment typically, or are they or are they an ongoing employee? So they've been employed longer than that one year period. And then again, were they hired in as full time? Were they hired in as variable or seasonal? So there are a lot of factors that come into play. Now, luckily we have a really nice publication on this that really walks through all these different steps to help you determine, you know, if if or when an employee would lose coverage if they changed from full-time to part-time. The next one here, again, just kind of going back to those look, look back measurement methods. You know, sometimes you have employers, they, they set these look backs up with their payroll vendor that handles their ACA reporting, but they're not really doing anything with it. So making sure that if you're using the look back measurement method, are you applying it appropriately? Are you checking each month and then each year to make sure that you have, you're identifying who may be eligible for coverage and are you making those offers of coverage? And then the last one here, um, again, some sticky situations. They're just different types of employees that are going to present challenges when it comes to identifying those hours or making those offers of coverage. You know, we get questions a lot about employees that are paid commission or on-call um, employees because maybe they don't have those traditional hours to check. So employers really just have to use a reasonable method to credit the hours to those employees, you know, and that can include time that is spent for travel or prep time for sales meetings. For on-call employees, it may be, you know, it's going to depend on does that employee have to remain on the premises during that on-call time? Are they paid during that on-call time? That kind of thing. So there are a lot of different factors that come into play there. And then we have things that, you know, with staffing agencies, that's going to boil down to the test to determine who's the common law employer. That's going to help guide who should actually be offering coverage to that individual. And then teachers or, you know, employees of educational institutions, it's going to depend on what kind of measurement method you're using. You know, it's going to depend on are they paid for the entire year or are they only paid for that nine out of 12 months that they're actually teaching or actually working at the school. So there are a lot of different factors that come into play with these methods. And again, we could spend the whole time today going through all these, but really just making sure that if you have employees that are falling into some, you know, non-traditional statuses, make sure that you understand what the rules are and how they work to make sure that you're making those offers of coverage appropriately. And so again, resources here, um, much like what Beth has, the IRS has some really great resources. Um, they have great FAQs and kind of just step-by-step -step instructions. So we have some here for how to identify full-time employees and then the Q&A for that. And then, as I mentioned, we have several different um, publications on this topic. So a basic one here is, you know, identifying those full-time employees that are subject to uh, the employer mandate. And if you want to go to the next one. And then we've got two more here. Again, I mentioned these. So look back. So a, a, an entire paper dedicated just to look back measurement methods. That's how important these are. And then 
this other one here. So look back measurement method offers of coverage and changes in status. I personally reference this one all the time because again, those changes from full-time to part-time, it depends so much on the facts that it's, you know, you've got to kind of revisit that each time to make sure that the offers are being made appropriately. So definitely if, you know, you're not familiar with these resources, please request these from your account team because it has a lot of good information that can kind of help you make sure you are properly identifying those full-time employees. And Thank now you, back to you, Kelly. Beth. Thank you, Kelly. And I have to second that last uh, paper that Kelly mentioned. Um, a lot of times we get questions about change in status. And so somebody goes from full-time to part-time and they're like, hey, how long do we have to offer them coverage or can they lose it that day? And I love that last publication because it has a really handy dandy flow chart um, that I also uh, love and point to as much as I can. So this next question um, about the employer mandate is what coverage must be offered and when? So <clears throat> mind you that the employer mandate, kind of as we already said, requires that minimum essential coverage that is minimum value and affordable is offered to substantially all full-time employees, okay? And so just to kind of break down those terms, minimum essential coverage is actually pretty broad, right? Uh, the definition that we get for that is pretty much going to include all fully insured or self-funded group health plan coverage, right? And so if you're receiving it likely from an employer um, and it offers health coverage, it may be enough uh, to be considered minimum essential health coverage or minimum essential coverage, right? Um, these next concepts are more specific, right? And so minimum value specifically um, is a plan that pays at least 60% of the costs incurred by the participant and their beneficiaries. Um, this one is not as simple right? And so you'd have to engage, let's say, the insurer or TPA potentially to run kind of actuarial analysis, if you will, of whether or not the plan pays uh, minimum value. Keep in mind that, you know, some employers choose to offer what's called like a skinny plan, and those are often not going to meet that minimum value um, definition because they're not covering, let's say, comprehensive health coverage, um, but it is a requirement for the employer to provide minimum value coverage to their full-time employees. And then also the coverage has to be affordable, right? And the definition of affordable um, is based on the lowest cost of self-only coverage that's provided, and it can't exceed um, a specific percentage that's pointed out by the government each year, okay? And so that percentage this year was 9.12. Next year, we're going to see a drop to 8.39. Um, and that is going to be based on kind of safe harbors as far as determining affordability that we'll talk about here briefly. Now, mind you, that kind of coverage has to be offered to substantially all, which is 95% or more of the employer's employees, right? And so sometimes employers will run into questions or run into issues with how many people they're choosing to, to offer this coverage, right? Some employers may make take the risk of not offering coverage to certain employees, um, but they have to make sure that if they do that, then they're in that 5% range of folks that they don't have to offer coverage or that they choose not to offer coverage, if you will. And so as far as affordability is concerned, obviously it's a little bit difficult because the statute actually talks about the coverage being affordable to someone based on their household income. Except obviously an employer doesn't really have a way of knowing what an employee's household income is, right? Because especially if they the person has a spouse, um, they may not know what the spouse makes or, you know, any other member of the household who might bring in money. Um, and so what the IRS has given us is three different ways that are safe harbors to determine if the coverage is affordable. Um, and the vast majority of employers are going to use these safe harbors to determine whether or not their coverage uh, meets that definition, okay? And so the first safe harbor is based on Form W-2 wages. Um, and so that's on box one of the wages um, that someone will make. Basically, the idea is like, okay, you take the amount in box one, um, you would divide that by 12, and then you would make sure that the premium that's charged to the employee is no more than this year, 9.12% uh, of the person's wage, uh, wages or salary, right? Um, this is one that we will see employers do. Let's say if they have a lot of people who are in the same kind of just don't have any variance in how much they make, right? Um, and maybe salary to make the same amount every year. Um, because I think the hard aspect of this is that it's in the same calendar year that the, you know, employer mandate applies to. So for example, for 2023, you would be looking at the box two wages for 2023. 
except most employers don't necessarily know that from the beginning when they're setting up the cost of the coverage. And so this is one that you're going to see employers do if their employees are, are somewhat static and kind of make the same or near the same from year to year, right? The federal poverty level is another safe harbor um, and it is based on the federal federal poverty level um, as indicated by the government every year. And so they'll say that for a family of so many, um, this is how much or where the federal poverty line is. And then the government will say, well, we will do um, a, you know, 9.12% of what that FPL is, is about $103 a month. If you offer coverage that is below that, um, then that coverage would be deemed to be affordable. And this is, you know, a good method for employers who are very generous and have, let's say, at least one um, option on their plan as far as self-only coverage that is below that amount, or maybe is offered to employees free of charge, right, where they're not paying anything. And so sometimes we'll see employers use the federal poverty level um, when they, like I said, offer coverage that the employees don't actually have to pay for. And then the last option is, I think, where we see a lot of employers land, which is with the rate of pay. And this particular um, affordability safe harbor takes the employee's hourly rate, potentially, um, and it's going to have to, and then basically, you know, we'll multiply that by 130 hours per month. Um, and if they're not doing hourly, it could be the salary, but they would take the monthly salary and then they would multiply that by the percentage, which is 9.12. Again, this is one that we see most employers land at um, when they're coming up with the amount. Uh, but importantly, these are the three safe harbors that are available, right? So employers probably are going to fall in one of these, right? And hopefully they know which one. As far as the timing of the coverage that has to be offered, it has to be offered by the first day of the fourth month after hire, right? Um, now keep in mind that this requirement under the employer mandate is not actually the same as the waiting period, right? So the waiting period is slightly different. That's going to be dictated by your plan terms. Um, and then there's also kind of the prohibition against excessive waiting periods under the ACA that says that you can't have a waiting period that's longer than 90 days, right? Um, and so a lot of employers then are going to be stuck to potentially doing, let's say, a waiting period that's the first of the month after 60 days um, because, you know, because of the prohibition on the waiting period, it has to be, you know, less than the 90 or 90 or less. Um, but then as far as the employer mandate is concerned, that coverage has to be offered by the first day of the fourth month. So those, those are two slightly different concepts, um, but they end up kind of working in concert to where employers need to know how that works out. And then also note that just because the employer mandate allows you to not offer that coverage uh, until the first day of the fourth month doesn't mean that if your plan document says something different, that that is not also a problem, right? So it may not be a problem under the employer mandate um, if you make someone wait until, you know, the first of the month, uh, first of the first and the fourth month after hire. But if your plan document says that your waiting period is 30 days, then that's not appropriate under your plan terms, right? It doesn't violate the employer mandate, but it's not, it's definitely not kosher either. So what do we see employers get wrong? With this, I think the first thing that I would note is that, you know, if you're going to exclude groups of employees, right? So you're going to say, okay, we know we have to offer coverage to substantially all of our employees, 95% uh, of the population or more. You want to make sure that you are right and spot on about that, right? And keep in mind that that 95%, that 5% is going to be based on ALE member. So you remember how we talked about control group employers um, and how they are all counted together when it comes to deciding the size of the company. But when it comes to the, employ uh, the IRS actually issuing penalties and noting that you have violated the employer mandate, they look at each of those individual members with an individual EIN separately, right? And so an employer might look at the whole number and say, okay, we have, you know, a thousand employees and 950 of them are offered coverage. Um, but then if they have, let's say, an employer member, so that's one EIN out of their group of EINs, where there's 10% of the population that's not covered, that is going to be a violation on that ILE member as well. And so you don't want to play that game unless you're very sure, right, about those numbers uh, being where they are for the ALE member um, in question. Also, you know, you don't want to use the wrong safe harbor um, or potentially not make sure that your, you know, numbers and your rates are correct at the start of the year. Um, sometimes we'll get questions from people at the end of a year when they're getting ready to report on that year saying, well, what was our safe harbor? 
And theoretically, you should know what your safe harbor was at the beginning of the year because that's what you were determining rates, right? Um, and so you want to make sure that when you are preparing for an upcoming year and what the rates will be, that you are taking the affordability you know, threshold for that upcoming year and you're doing your rate calculations based on that and not trying to come after the fact to figure out what the rates should have been or whether or not they were deemed affordable. Now, as far as some sticky situation, um, we run into some problems, honestly, like when things change, right? So for example, if you have leaves of absence, um, this could affect affordability in some situations, right? And so we talked about the W-2 safe harbor. Um, and if people take leave, um, you know, then that could end up being potentially an issue. You want to be careful um, because obviously if someone has a certain period of time where they're still eligible for coverage, but um, they are not being paid, um, then that can become a time where, you know, 9.12% of zero um, is zero, right? Um, and so you want to make sure that you understand how the rules work, if there are any changes in when uh, a person takes leave and if they remain eligible. Mind you, um, that there's also going to be, you know, MA situations that could cause some issues um, here, you know. And so, for example, when is a buyer going to be required to actually offer coverage to full time employees of the seller? Um, generally, you know, when an employer buys another a company and they become that company's full-time employees, um, then they would likely be required to offer coverage to those employees. Now, mind you, this gets very difficult. You want to make sure you're consulting with legal counsel because this type of sale can affect this, right? The coverage that's in place, how long it's going to remain in place for either parties um, can, can go into this equation. And so you just want to be careful and understand what's required there. And then also, one of the things that we'll mention, and I think we got a question in the chat that kind of, or in the Q&A that kind of spoke about independent contractors. Keep in mind that when we talk about employees, we're talking about employees, right? And very specifically, common law employees. Independent contractors are not employees. And the IRS and the DOL are going to say that they shouldn't be right? Uh, so not only should they um, not be considered employees, they shouldn't be offered coverage because doing so could make it appear that you are actually uh, misclassifying independent contractors. So you want to be careful with that, okay? So again, just some resources we have. We have a whole paper on uh, penalties, ACA employer mandate penalties and affordability um, that, you can, that you can find. All right, Kelly, you want to talk about the penalties? I sure do. Yeah. And I, and obviously, I hope that this is not something that most on this call end up having to experience, but um, we definitely get questions about it. So it's important to understand, you know, what the risks are and what those penalties are that an employer might um, end up getting. Can you go to the next one? There we go. Thank you. So first, we just kind of look at that, just an overview of, you know, what are the penalties under the employer mandate. So penalties are going to be triggered um, if one, got in all caps there, just one full-time employee goes to the exchange and receives a premium tax credit, or again, a subsidy, right? So it, it's that employee, that full-time employee of yours that is getting that subsidy that's gonna be the trigger for any of these penalties that we're talking about. And so most of you have probably heard these before, you know, they've been called penalty A, penalty B. Um, when they first came out, we had the sledgehammer and the tack hammer. Um, so we'll kind of talk through these. And both of these um, penalty amounts are indexed each year. So they go up each year. So they started out, I think at 2,000 and 3,000 um, and obviously have risen over the years. So our, our first penalty here, so the penalty A or the sledgehammer, again, because this is the one that has the potential to be rather large. So you're gonna incur penalty A if you fail to offer minimum essential coverage to at least 95% of your full-time employees and their dependents. Okay, so 95%, that's a pretty high number there. Obviously there's a little 5% margin if someone didn't get offered coverage and they should have. But so that penalty, um, it's going to be assessed based on the number of full-time employees, although you do get a credit of 30 employees. So let's say you had 200 full-time employees and you got this penalty. 
you would get a credit of 30. So your penalty would be assessed on that 170 employees. So in 2023, this penalty is 2,880. And then for 2024, it goes up just a little bit to 2,970. Again, so nearly $3,000 per person. So if we're assessing $3,000 on a couple hundred employees, or even for these very large employers, even bigger, that can get pretty large. And that's why this one is the sledgehammer. Now, the next penalty is the one that sometimes I think can be a little more common. So this is our penalty B or our tack hammer. Still not something that you want to incur, but typically will be a lower amount. So you're gonna have penalty B in instances where the employer fails to offer minimum value coverage that is affordable, I'll say, and or it is not affordable to that full-time employee, okay? So where we, I, I think we see this a lot is on the affordable side. So somebody was offered coverage, but it was not affordable. Again, and it, it, I think it's always helpful to remember, um, and I think Beth touched on this anyway, it's not just that it's not affordable to the employee as in they don't think it feels affordable, but it's gonna be based on those safe harbors that Beth went through. So if the coverage is not affordable based on that safe harbor and that employee goes to the marketplace or goes to the exchange and gets a subsidy, you, the employer, are going to incur a penalty. And so the penalty B is a little bit larger, um, but it's only going to apply to those affected employees. So instead of the penalty applying to all full-time employees, it would only apply to those specific employees that should have been offered that minimum value affordable coverage, and they were not, and therefore they went to the marketplace and got a subsidy. So in 2023, that amount was or is $4,320 per person. And then for 2024, again, rises slightly, that penalty will be $4,460. And so how do you know you got a penalty? Well, typically a year or two after the plan year ends, you're gonna get what's called a 226J letter from the IRS. And so this is basically a letter to the employer that says, hey, we have this person who received a penalty, or excuse me, a subsidy um, on the exchange and you may be subject to a penalty. And so it's gonna give you information on how to review it and what to do to, um, you know, to respond because you're gonna to need to do research and figure out is this penalty legitimate? Um, and if so, you know, identify what has happened. So we'll go ahead and go to the next one. Okay, so what are what are the issues here? Again, miscalculating the risk, so making, you know, not realizing that they are potentially um, subject to the penalties, right? Not realizing that you didn't offer coverage as well. Assuming the IRS may not catch up to them. Say, eh, what are they gonna do? They're not gonna catch me. Obviously, that's not an approach we recommend. Um, some employers don't realize that they may actually have some responsibility, right? So you need to make sure that your vendor, if you're contracting with one, is actually using, you know, submitting forms on your behalf. Big one here, do not ignore letters from the IRS. That's just general guidance there, but especially these 226J letters. The IRS is going to give you 30 days to respond. If you don't respond, then they're going to assume that you are accepting the penalty. So make sure that if you get a letter, you're working with your benefits counsel right away to ensure that you are responding appropriately. So again, sticky situations that happen. Again, M&A, we've talked about that. Just make sure that that liability is understood as part of that transaction. And then obviously make sure that before you submit those forms to the IRS, make sure that they are correct. Make sure that what your vendor is doing is correct. Go ahead and go to the next one. So again, resources here. Again, the IRS has a couple great sites with information and Q&As on this topic as well. And then we've got a, a paper, a publication as well, that's going to talk about, again, what are those penalties and what makes something affordable? And back, uh, back to you, Beth, for plan documents. Thank you. Thank you. And, and this is just a brief kind of mention of just plan document rules. Obviously, um, you all are familiar with ERISA. And the concept is that, you know, with the plan documents, including the summary plan description, those are usually going to require information on eligibility to be included. OK. And so when we start talking about an eligibility in the terms of eligibility, if you use the look back measurement methods, that should likely be included in the SPD so that employees understand 
understand whether or not they're eligible. And whether or not they're eligible is going to turn on whether or not they are going to um, measure to be full time. And so you want that information to be included in the documents and you want the plan to actually be operated in accordance with those documents as well. <laughs> So keep in mind that, you know, when it comes to kind of just this requirement, you want to make sure that the document vendor that you're using to create your documents is familiar with the fact that you actually use the look back measurement method if that's what you do, because you want that information to be included in the SPD. And then obviously, if it's in the plan document, then you want to make sure that you're operating the plan that way. And you want to make sure that the tracking vendor that you use to track hours is also aware of your plan terms so that it all matches. I know that sounds like a very kind of just, you know, common sense thing, um, but we often run into situations where the plan document will say one thing or will be silent, but the employer has been operating the plan in a different way, okay? So we want to steer clear of that uh, issue. All right, so we're going to switch gears and talk a little bit about ACA reporting. All right, thanks, Beth. <clears throat> so yeah, now we're going to talk through again. We've We've identified what needs to be done, and now we're kind of looking at just some of the basic mechanics as far as you know, how does this information get to the IRS? So when we're looking at the ACA reporting for the employer mandate, there's really two sections of the code that we're looking at. And you'll see these listed sometimes. So we have section 6055 and section 6056. So 6055, it was really designed to support the individual mandate, which I think most of us know that, you know, there used to be a penalty that could be assessed to someone for not having health coverage. However, that penalty was reduced to $0 in 2019, although the mandate still stands. Um, but employers have an obligation to report, you know, if an individual is enrolled in that minimum essential coverage. And so who owns that responsibility? So for a fully insured plan, the insurer, so the insurance carrier, is going to be the one who's going to report who is actually covered under the plan. And then for a self-insured plan, the plan sponsor, which is often the employer, they own the obligation. Big important reminder here, if you sponsor a level funded or a modified self-funded plan, you are considered self-insured. So that means you have this obligation to report who was covered under your plan, okay? You don't have an insurance carrier that is doing that. And then section 6056, so this is the re re reporting piece that's designed to support the employer mandate. So again, it's going to be for those employers that are applicable large employers, so 50 or more employees. So this part is going to report offers of coverage, so making sure that you as the employer offered coverage to those employees that you're supposed to. And again, the ALE is going to own this obligation because you are the employer subject to that part of the mandate. Okay, so here's a chart that I really think is helpful um, for employers to see. It's just going to show, you know, what size of employer. So are you a small employer? So again, not an applicable large employer, or, or are you a large employer? And then are you self-insured or fully insured? And so again, those if you're a small, fully insured plan, there's nothing you need to do. If you are a small, self-insured plan, you're going to own that reporting responsibility um, under 6055. And then for our large plans, again, you're going to have an obligation under 6056 if you are fully insured. And then if you are large and self-insured, you're going to have this under 6055 and 6056. Okay, so what do we see wrong here? Again, we talked about this a few times, just making sure that the ALE status is calculated and handled appropriately. Um, this next one I see quite a bit, especially for those small groups. So assuming the carrier is handling all reporting obligations, right? Make sure that, you know, you understand who is doing what, even if you have contracted some of this out. Again, level funded, modified self-funded, you are self-insured. So you may be able to get some help with your TPA. Sometimes the TPAs will actually produce the 1095B form but you as the self-insured plan sponsor still have to actually transmit it to the IRS. So don't just assume that because you're under 50 employees, you have nothing to do. And again, make sure you're prepping and working with that vendor for the 2024 reporting season. Anything you can do ahead of time um, is definitely worthwhile. <clears throat> 
So Beth will take on penalties. Sure. Um, the deadlines and the penalties. Sure. All right. So let's jump into that. Um, keep in mind that, you know, it's been a kind of interesting road with the deadlines for reporting because for so many years, the IRS would kind of come out and give us a reprieve. OK, but they lead us to believe that that's kind of done. And because they have kind of moved the deadline over the years to where they're kind of giving us a certain amount of time. And this is what it is now. Right. Um, and so by February 28th, you have to file uh, the paper forms with the IRS. OK. Um, and so that is only going to be uh, those filing fewer than 10 forms um, starting next year. OK. And so most of the people on this call, if not all, will not be filing those paper forms with the IRS. Um, and so that is not going to be kind of a deadline that most of us have to have to comply with. OK. By March 2nd, or March 1st in a leap year like 2024, you have to distribute for the forms uh, to the employees and or plan enrollees, right? Um, and this is because we got a permanent 30-day extension from that original January 31st deadline that was in place. Um, and so now you kind of just have until March 2nd to distribute the forms to the employees. And then you have until March 31st to file the electronic forms with the IRS. Note here, you're, you're required to give them out to employees before you're actually required to give them to the IRS. And so that kind of begs the question or assumes that by March 2nd, you have the forms. Um, so hopefully you're doing those and giving them to the IRS as well. Um, but you do have a little bit of additional time to file with the IRS because they give you until the end of the month of March to do that. Um, when a due date falls on a weekend or a federal holiday, that due date is extended to the next business day, which kind of applies to all of the different tax forms we have, right? So that's not kind of different that way. And then keep in mind that the deadline is the same for all employers, right? So like there's no difference on when you're supposed to be filing those forms for anyone, really. Um, and so we all have these same date requirements. Now, penalties are pretty steep, okay? Um, and consider that the the failure, let's say you just don't do reporting at all. Um, it's considered a double failure because it's both a failure to file with the IRS and a failure to distribute the forms to individuals um, as well. And so that basically ends up being $560 per form if you did not actually do the filing, right, or distribute it to employees. That is a lot of money, right, um, because it ends up being $560 per person. And uh, so keep in mind that you want to be very careful with that. Um, the employer mandate penalties <clears throat> can also potentially come to light if you haven't reported or if you report and something's wrong with the reporting. So keep in mind um, that if you report and how you report um, can affect whether or not you end up receiving that 226J letter because there are parts of the reporting forms where you indicate whether or not you have actually complied with the employer mandate, right? Um, and so you want to review that reporting as well, even if you're having a service provider do it. And then obviously the IRS is continuing to enforce both the employer mandate and reporting requirements. We're seeing um, it, it used to be that it would take kind of the IRS years, right? So like, for example, in 2021, we might just now be receiving letters based on 2018. Um, the IRS, believe it or not, has kind of gotten a little bit faster with that, still not super fast, right? But we're starting to see more of these letters quicker. And so keep in, the, keep in mind that they're sending them and you do not want to ignore those 226J letters because they will turn into penalties and demand letters to pay penalties. <laughs> All right, so some new information that we have, Kelly. All right, thanks, Beth. Yeah, some uh, some maybe not so good information for some folks, but we do have a change in the electronic reporting requirements beginning in 2024. So prior to you know January of 2024, employers could file via paper if they were filing 250 or, or fewer than 250 forms. Again, very specific just to those 1095 forms, but Beginning January 1st of 2024, employers filing 10 or more forms must file electronically. Okay. And what's interesting here, too, is that employers now have to aggregate return types to reach that 10. So it's not just employers filing 10 or more 1095s, but it's actually going to aggregate 1095s plus W-2s or 1099s or other tax forms. Okay, so if I have a really small self-insured employer, and let's say they have seven W-2s, and then they had five people on their self-insured health plan, so they have five 1095Bs. Well, seven plus five is 12. So 12 exceeds that 10 count, and therefore, 
they must actually file these forms electronically. Okay, so really this means that most employers are now going to have to file electronically. Okay, so this could be a really big change for let's say those self-insured or level funded employers with fewer than 50 um, employees who maybe previously had been filing via paper. And there is a penalty if you don't comply. So a penalty of $310 per return if you do not file electronically and you are supposed to, unless the employer can establish reasonable cause. Okay, and then if you are filing amended forms or form corrections, you do have to file those in the same manner as before. So this can be really important, I think, again, for those small employers. So if you're that small self-insured plan, a lot of the times you're probably filing via paper because payroll companies or these other third-party vendors weren't always set up to handle just these 1095B forms. They're really designed for those large employer 1095C forms. So you will need to make sure that you have something in place to comply with this electronic filing beginning January 1st. So we definitely recommend if you are someone who is typically filed via paper, you wanna make sure you are engaging with a reporting vendor as soon as possible. So, you know, oftentimes checking with your payroll provider is a good first step because you want to make sure that you are set up for those electronic reports or reporting, you know, as of January 1st. Now, they do have a hardship waiver process in place. So there's a form 8508 that an employer could file to request a hardship waiver from having to electronically file. Um, the IRS does recommend filing this at least 45 days in advance. Um, so again, if you think you may have a case for a hardship waiver, definitely recommend looking into this. You would just have to wait until after January 1st to submit that waiver. Go ahead and go to the next one. Again, we've got more resources. Again, the IRS has great ones. We have great ones. Definitely recommend reaching out to your account team if you need them. All right, so to end out this discussion today, we're going to talk briefly about state reporting requirements. Um, now, we just spent time talking about the federal reporting requirements, but that is based on federal law, specifically the Affordable Care Act, um, and applies, you know, based on, you know, whether or not you have the full-time employees. Um, and then also we know that there are states that actually have, let's say, a state individual mandate that comes with basically state individual mandating re mandate reporting um, that can apply to employers of all sizes, okay? Um, and so keep in mind that several states basically added some kind of individual mandate. Once the federal individual mandate penalty was reduced to zero, um, we know right now that there are six states that have individual mandate reporting requirements. So if you're on this call and you you're looking at this list of the six states and you know that you have employees that live in those states, right? Not that they work there, but that they live in those states, then you are going to be subject to the requirement to the report to report to the state um, whether or not you are offering them coverage, right? So hopefully everyone on the call is not, this is not new to you. Um, this is not the first time you're hearing this, this, this um, information, but keep in mind that we have some states who actually require you to provide some reporting. Now, the good news is um, a lot of them, if not all of them, will basically take the same forms that you're doing for the IRS, right? So it's not necessarily you doing double the work, but you do want to be familiar with the specific processes in those specific states and making sure that you are, um, you know, working with a vendor to make, sure, to make sure that these filings are occurring. And then also, again, we have some resources. We have a webinar we did earlier this year, and you can ask your advisor um, to get access uh, or to get the recording or the slides on, from that webinar, um, as well as having a paper where we go through each of the state requirements and kind of give you the information that we that we have and have been able to assess from the state, as well as providing some links to each of uh, the pages and websites of each of those states, okay? So that's another paper that you can ask um, your advisor for. Now, man, we didn't even leave time for like any questions. Um, Yoko, anything you want to add or have us address in the next 30 seconds? I'll take that as a no. I guess not. <laughs> I, I will say, I, I noticed in the q and I think we got lots of questions about the resources that we were mentioning. Um, and again, we've got so many really good ones. So just if you're curious about some of the ones we mentioned, please reach out to someone on your account team to make sure that um, you get a copy of that and kind of 
work through that because there's definitely a lot of good information out there. Great. Thank you. And Amber, do you want to come along with our outro today? Yes. Thank you, Beth. Thank you, Beth and Kelly, for sharing your valuable time and expertise with us today. To reiterate, today's presentation was recorded. We will be sharing the recording in the follow-up email and on the NFP website. If there are any portions of this call that you missed by Monday, you will receive an email with a link to the full recording. The PowerPoint slides used during this presentation will be shared in the same email. At the end of this call, a survey will populate in a brief in a new window. Please take a brief moment to complete the survey as it lets us know what topics are important to our listeners and helps make our education program as current and relevant as possible. That concludes our webinar for today. Thank you everyone for joining us and have a great day.